Well, it's safe to say it's been a really long time since I've made a video and I'm sorry, I've been distracted. Finally, I have a bit of time to get back and make one. And this is the most overdue video I've ever made in my life. Okay, months ago on stories, I put out a Q&A asking if there was anything that anyone wanted to know, whether it was to do with the show, the feed, the Irish property market, as much as I can help, structural stuff, as much as I can help as well. And I got loads of questions and then didn't have any time to actually make a video to answer them. So I'm sorry. We're going to get started now. I have 12 to start with and I'm going to just put up a couple every week and hopefully we'll get through the hundreds of them that came in pretty soon. So let's get started. Okay, so the first question is, is a mortgage hard to get to restore an old property? Well, I think kind of the simple answer to that is yes. I mean, banks seem to not really want to give them. You have to kind of cajole a little bit and, you know, kind of nudge your way into the rooms to actually get people to talk to you about these kind of mortgages. But they do exist. Like I was saying earlier about getting feedback on stories, I put out a question about this exact thing on my stories two weeks ago and I got loads of info back from people who have actually gotten mortgages for these type of houses and what I asked them was to name the bank that they got it off of and if there was any hoops that they had to jump through so we kind of had an idea of which type of a mortgage would suit us the best. Now I got so many replies. If you go to my Instagram feed and you go up to the little story highlights there's one called mortgages and I put all of the answers that I featured into that. So hopefully that'll help you a bit. I mean, Ulster Bank, AIB, Bank of Ireland, they were all named in it. So there are options out there. It's just a matter of getting a branch that's willing to work with you or maybe even just go through a broker and get them to deal with the mortgage companies for you. It might be a little bit of extra expense, but it might actually be worth it in the long run to get a mortgage on one of these houses. <laughs> okay, second question. Is it worth getting a surveyor to have a look at the house before making a decision? Yes, a thousand times yes. When I got my survey done on my place when I bought it, I got it done because I was made get it done by the mortgage company. And to be honest, a lot of mortgage companies are just going to make you do it anyway. But if you're a cash buyer and you don't need a survey for a mortgage, just spend the money for the peace of mind that your house is not going to fall down around your ears in like a year's time. I mean, they spot things that we don't spot with the naked eye. I mean, even on the show, I remember bringing a couple one time to a house that had subsidence and Kieran was so helpful explaining it to us and all. But when I saw it, it was cracks. And to me, I thought, well, cracks above the windows. Maybe there's a problem with the heads. Maybe they were wooden or something. And like having any kind of a expert opinion on stuff like that just helps so much for when you're making the decision you know don't splash out on every single house you go to see but if there's one of them that you're like staying awake about you're really strongly considering putting in an offer on and you your partner your family whoever just absolutely love the place spend the money on the survey and at least then you know that what you're getting is actually still going to be standing in 10 years time <laughs> Okay, question number three. Do you want people to send you links to cheap houses? Yes, yes, I would love that. I look for them all, all the time. Jay looks for them. Anybody I can wrangle into looking for houses with me does it. It would be so nice if people started sending us in houses. You know, I take them off estate of agents' websites and off portals and stuff like that. But it would be so nice to actually deal with the people who own the houses and be able to ask them questions and, you know, find out little bits of history about the houses and stuff like that. It just it all helps when it comes to selling it because the buyers know a little bit more about it. So, yeah, I mean, it would be really nice to have the owner of the house on the other end of an email instead of a estate agent. So, yes, send them in if you have them. I would love it. <laughs> OK, next one. Are you guaranteed planning permission if there is a dwelling house or a shed on site? Now, I'm not an expert about planning, but I'm pretty sure the answer to that is no. First of all, an outbuilding isn't a house. It's somewhere that used to store livestock or tools or things like that. And even commercial buildings, you know, they're not habitable structures. They don't have chimneys and fireplaces and septic tanks and bedrooms and stuff like that. So they weren't designed for human habitation originally. Now you can get planning permission to convert them 
and that's totally normal to do that but no you can't just rock in and go i'm gonna live in this shed and you know you could have neighbors nearby who are quite content with farm buildings beside them but not necessarily okay with them all being turned into houses so definitely that's something you want to look into now when it comes to a house my understanding when i bought this place was that if you found a house and you were willing to live in it and it had a roof and it had a door or half a door <laughs> and you were willing to put the windows back in and stuff like that i never thought there was any issue with it. it's only recently that i'm hearing people say oh i couldn't get planning permission to live in that house i was so shocked that you would even ask for planning permission to live in a house if it's a pile of stones in the corner of a field and it doesn't have a roof or anything like that and you need to fundamentally change what it looks like on the outside i would definitely recommend you get planning permission if it's just an old house that isn't particularly pretty or particularly well kept then my opinion would be that you could just live in it but if you want to be safe definitely check it with somebody who's a little bit more experienced than me for sure and let me know the answer so i can tell people in the future <laughs> okay the next one have you ever gotten bad vibes from a house you visited i haven't actually now that you say it i kind of think you probably would you know if there was kind of something weird that happened in in the past or something but no i've been quite lucky i suppose that i've never kind of went when i went into a house so i suppose the answer is that's no Okay, number six. Can you see somewhere online how you saved and fixed your lovely farmhouse? I don't really have anywhere online. I don't think that I have it detailed. I suppose when I was doing this place up, and keep in mind, I'm still doing this place up. It's not finished, you know. I didn't borrow a huge amount of money to do up this house. I do it as I have the money to do it. So, you know, it's definitely very much still a work in progress. But I suppose when I was doing it first, like I took pictures and I have them, but... I suppose I was just so focused on working and paying the bills and saving to get the stuff done. And, you know, social media wasn't really as big a thing 15 years ago as it is now. So, no, I do have photos. I don't have them up online. Someday I'll have a bit of time and I'll put some up. And I've been kind of trying gradually to start putting stuff up a bit more about the house because it is something I just definitely don't do. I mean, anything that I do put up is over on my Maggie Malloy Instagram. It's the one I use for my illustration and for just life in Lock Isle and stuff. So if you're interested in that side of things, as opposed to this, you know, real estate side, then definitely go over to Maggie.Malloy on Instagram and you'll definitely see a lot more of, I suppose, the personal side of my life here. <laughs> okay, what's the difference between a ruin and a place that just needs a lot of work? <laughs> that's such a good question in my mind a ruin doesn't have a roof and like the walls are falling down so it's essentially a pile of stones that maybe you could see a gable end on if you're lucky but really it's a wreck wreck anything other than that i would probably say i wouldn't class as a ruin but to be honest i'd even want to save the ruins so i'm not even saying don't save those ones only save the ones that have roofs and windows and stuff in them you know i suppose a house that needs to be done up as opposed to a house that needs to be rebuilt are two very, very different things. So if you only have the money or the stamina to do up a house as opposed to, you know, doing rebuilding work and structural work, then definitely make sure it still has a roof. Make sure that it has windows of some sort, a door. I mean, honestly, even if they have to be repaired one by one, that's totally fine. If the glass is broken in them, it's totally fine. You know, even if like the little bits at the bottom of them are rotten, you can get just those bits of the windows replaced by a joiner. You don't need to go out and just pull all the windows out of your house and put them all back in again. So yeah, pile of stones, I would class as a ruin. Anything else, I would class as a house. <laughs> okay, next one. How do you overcome low window heights in old cottages, especially when fitting new kitchens? And that's a really, really good question. I have low windows here in this place. And originally I had my sink unit in front of one of the low windows and half the window was blocked out because of my Belfast sink unit. And I didn't have enough walls in the room that had blank space on them to take the sink off of that wall. So I kind of ended up just blocking out half the light for a really, really long time. It got to a stage eventually where I decided to move the kitchen into the sitting room or the good room and then move the sitting room in where the ingle nook was because 
there was a lot less wall space in there whereas the good room kind of like the parlor had just big open walls where I could fit kitchen presses and stuff on so I think changing around which room you use for the kitchen is a really really big thing that you can do other than that you know, stop your kitchen presses at the right hand side of the window, maybe put a little window seat in. I mean, you don't have to actually build one because you've three foot thick walls so you can sit on the windowsill and nothing's going to happen. But, you know, fire a couple of cushions in on it, use it as a seat, you know, that's enough. Maybe put a little forum or something in front of it if you don't want to sit on the window itself and then continue on the presses at the far side. And, do you know, that's enough to at least make it feel functional. I know in a lot of old houses I've been in, the kitchen table gets put in front of the window. So, I mean, if it, they're too low or they just don't suit ending kitchen presses, maybe just put the kitchen table over there and align your kitchen around the other walls in, you know, the room. And it might maybe help a little bit. Definitely low windows are a weird one. Low doorways, everything. I mean, these houses are quirky. They're not built for fitted kitchen. So for sure, it takes a little bit of ingenuity to try and get them to look really, really good. <laughs> okay, this is a good one. How much hidden costs are in the process of buying an old house? So when I bought mine, which is the only experience I can talk about at the moment, I paid for my survey. I paid for a valuation on the house as well. So these are things that get the bank requests. So like if you want 80,000 for your house, the bank will get you to send a valuer out to the house and confirm that the house is worth what you want to borrow. So the surveyor tells them the house isn't going to fall down. The valuer tells them that the house is worth what you want to borrow. Then I paid solicitor's fees and my solicitor's fees were basically just so he could do searches to make sure that there weren't two people who owned the house, there weren't rights away, there weren't, you know, problems with the deeds or stuff like that. And he also then will register all that stuff as the process moves forward to make sure that you are the legal owner or that the bank is mentioned on the documents and stuff like that. Other than that, I paid the deposit, but I mean, you expect to pay that because you have that saved anyway in your money. But yeah, I mean, that was all I paid. It wasn't a massive amount of money. I mean, back when I started, they didn't have property tax. So, I mean, that obviously comes into play every year. Oh, and stamp duty. You have to pay stamp duty as well, which is, I think, like 1%, 10%. I don't know which one it is, but I know that when you look up houses on Daft and stuff, there's a little thing on the side and it tells you how much the stamp duty would be on that property based on the purchase price on the other side of the page. So you'll be able to find it out easy enough from there. But I think that's all the fees I paid anyway when I was getting my house. Okay, are you a property investor or do you have rentals? <laughs> no, <laughs> I have one house, this house, and that's it. And I don't want any more houses. And you know, I'll be paying this off for a long time, the same as all you guys are going to be doing with your houses when you buy them. I'm not some guru that goes around, you know, picking up derelict houses around the country and then trying to convince unsuspecting young people to buy them off me without me even tidying them up beforehand. This is not what I do. <laughs> no, I do not own any property other than the house I live in. <laughs> okay, is it possible to find a habitable house under 100k? It absolutely is possible to find that. When it comes to the properties in that bottom half of the market, you're going to need to go out into western, northwestern counties to find them. Um, but they're there, you know. When we were looking at houses up in Sligo, Mayo and stuff like that, like, yeah, you can get a derelict house for 29000 or 30000 But if you're willing to spend close to 100000 on a house up there, you can move in. And that's a really, really big thing. So if you're willing to move and you're willing to live in a house that's not brand new, then yeah, you can absolutely find a habitable house once you go to the west, up into the northwest, or maybe even in the Midlands. You know, the Midlands, Tipperary, you would get a house for under 100,000 that was habitable, sure. And even like those little terraces that you see in towns and villages, I mean, those houses, they're not necessarily that old. They're not necessarily left to go derelict for that long because generally when they're on a main street, you know, people just don't let them go completely. So yeah, there are totally houses out there to be had for under 100,000 that are habitable. <laughs> okay, last one. How often do you find houses along the East Coast? I want to live in Wicklow, but in a farmhouse. Oh God. <laughs> okay, 
I never find properties in Wicklow. Maybe I found one in the year, year and a half that I've been doing this. Um, Wexford, I don't really find that many. Dublin, I have found one ever, ever under 100,000. I mean, the thing with me, you have to remember, though, is I limit my houses to 100,000. Now, that's not saying that there aren't houses out there for 110 or 120, which are still quite modest budgets. And, you know, they're within your reach without you having this huge mortgage. But they're just not ones I look at because they don't fall underneath the threshold for the feed. Now, something funny I noticed a couple of weeks ago, I was browsing online and I noticed there was a farmhouse in Wexford. And it was, you know, it wasn't like looking out over the ocean or anything super fantastic. I mean, it was gorgeous, don't get me wrong. But it was like here in Loch Isle, it was one of those big old farmhouses with farmyards and stuff around it. But it wasn't modernised at all. Like it had looked like it had been shut up for years. It was 200,000 euro. Oh, holy God. I was thinking, that's crazy. You know, so sometimes when you're in a house like this and you kind of think, it's hard sometimes, you know, it's difficult and you can struggle and sometimes, you know, things go wrong and you have to maintain it a lot. And then you kind of think to yourself, what's the alternative for us? Like, what other options do we have? You know, me buying a 200,000 euro derelict farmhouse in Wexford and getting to live where I grew up. I mean, my life wouldn't have even properly started by now if that was the case. God. Okay, end of that one. So that's it. 12 questions, 12 answers. I have so many more. I have a couple of them that are quite, no, it's not a couple. I have a lot of them that are, you know, aimed at more professional people than me, you know, very specific questions that are more legal or structural or stuff like that. And I'm going to try and wrangle in a couple of professionals to maybe do a couple of answers for me so that you guys can get a little bit more information. So you're not just listening to me jabber on about the things I think I know about these houses. We're going to try and get real information so that when it comes to buying your house or even selling your house or whatever it is you want to do to move forward, that you know a little bit more than you did before. So 